Good afternoon, and welcome to the Days of Learning podcast. My name is David Delson, one of our hosts. And this is such a joyful time because I get to spend some time with some new and longtime friends. And uh, my co host today is Miss Yvonne Greer, principal of Why Eat Right Nutritional Counseling for Healthy Evening Eating. Yvonne, it's such a joy to see you today. Yes, definitely, David. It's always a great pleasure to come back and do these days of learning back to the kitchens with you uh, and having such dynamic guests, community champions. Oh so, man, the, the community champions and, and yourself are what make this and we have this, con con this conversation. And for those who aren't aware, Days of Learning Back to the Kitchen is sponsored by the Center for Disease Control uh, and Prevention, um, an 1815 grant that we received through the State of Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Yvonne, we're gonna be talking about a a, a challenging topic today, but yet I know that it's going to be filled with stories of hope and with uh, joy and love. What is our topic for today? Well, our topic for today is getting to the roots, impacting social determinants of health. This is Minority Health Month, so this is a great time to really um, zero in on you know, what are those social determinants of health that can impact a person's life from um, beginning on? So the theme for this presentation is achieving healthy living throughout the life course. And so when we start thinking about um, being born into a life, sometimes they say that, uh, say for instance, the African-American culture, sometimes they're saying that you're born 10 years left life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Why would that be at birth before any insults or anything? You can start looking at those social determinants of health. However, that is not totally, you know, how your life course can go because you can have different things that can impact and make sure you stay on that trajectory of health. And so that's where I've been at looking at the idea that from birth to old age, we need to make sure that we are having an optimal lifestyle and an optimal environment for health and for growth and longevity. You know, Yvonne, you and I have known each other for 15 years since I first walked into this community and uh, you have been a champion for health and wellness. And I think one of the things that we have talked about over the years is that we want to recognize that there are inequities, that there are disparities in our community, especially among black and brown communities. <clears throat> At the same time, I think that we would all agree that we are in a movement, a movement that recognizes the assets that exist in the community. You know, we might not be able to change the paradigm for all people in mm -hmm. our lifetimes. But we're thinking about this over the course of the next 10, 20, or 30 or more years. So the next generation can have even more opportunities than the future. And, and you know, as we go into this, Yvonne, I want to thank you for reminding me of, let's focus on the assets. Yes, that was one of the reasons why when, I thought of going back to the kitchen and I thought about what was going on because, you know, with the COVID pandemic, it was really zeroing in on the idea that some um, people of color have higher risk factors for diabetes, for obesity, for, you know, um, heart disease. And it, the message almost was like, oh, we don't care about our health. And that's not true. And that we have so many assets and community champions who are in our community every day promoting health and wellness. And sometimes they never get seen or heard. I know they're there. I work with them all the time. We've got yoga instructors. We have um, vegetarian chefs. We have all kinds of people. We have our guests that's coming on today. And yet, somehow they weren't being showcased. So I wanted to showcase our community champions. And I also wanted to bring out 
as you were saying, the positive aspects of what's going on, because we, we do many times focus on, you know, what are those health risks and what are those needs? What are those challenges? We never talk about what has been done well. And that brings me to the question of the day. So the question of the day that I came up with was, what is one personal behavior, I should say one personal behavioral change that has improved your health. One thing that you have incorporated, that positive thing that has improved your health. And I thought that was really good because, you know, we're doing food demos, we're doing this, we're saying people should walk. I wanted to say that for me, I had two things and I have fell off on one, but I'm going to get back on it. And that was my guru of health. My, my, my family teases me about the guru. It's, it's an online physical fitness um, uh, session that you can do every day with the um, guru of, of health that is a senior body sculpting class. So it has exercise, it has weightlifting, it's all sorts of things. And it, it's at nine o'clock, it's free if you're on Facebook. I have been doing that regularly and kind of fell off a little, got to get back on the bandwagon. But the big thing that has really changed my, my at least I think it's changed my health is I keep um, the fixing for a healthy trail mix in the house at all times. And when I'm really getting backed up in things on eating, that healthy trail mix is giving me that healthy nuts, you know, healthy foods in general, and it just seems like it has really made a difference. And somehow, since I've been eating that trail mix, I'm losing weight. I guess it's the exercise and the other thing, but I think that healthy trail mix is it. But we people say, eat a lot of nuts. And most people think, of, how can I do it? I found a way and I found a section at Audi's that's in the baking session that give you those low calorie, and I say not low calorie, but low cost, way to get nuts in low cost so that's that's my that's my story i'm sticking with it i love i love it and i love that assets uh, that asset base it, it is something that i i give you credit for uh whenever i speak about it in public and in private <clears throat> and i think for me yvonne i would say that my my health my health uh, behavior change is that <clears throat> i'm really in as i turned 60 recently i'm really focusing on holistic health and, and for me that has been a a, a resurgence in my faith okay. in my health and wellness my psychosocial uh be, my psychosocial mental health of course my physical health and i think the idea of the friendships because uh, of the, the deep and lasting friendships that we have they do promote health and they do help me one give me the support that I need. And two, and, and you are one of my accountability partners, hold me accountable to the things that we do say and how we act. And I think in the end that that when you have people that love you, that they will hold you accountable in the spaces that you want to improve upon. And so I think that that has in the last three to five years, that has been an important part for me. And as you just said, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> well, thank you, David. I mean, you give me too much credit, but I do try to, I do try to bring things up. I, that was one of my goals was to not be afraid to speak up. And that sometimes, you know, when you, you're working a lot cross-culturally, you don't want to offend people. So sometimes you just suck it up and don't say nothing. Well, I know it's a little hard sometimes, but I try to now speak up and sometimes it's, it's not easy, but I do. I do try to, you know, hold myself accountable to sticking with that type of goal. And, and then we can pass it along to others as well. S speaking of accountability, I want to, since they're both here, let's introduce our, let's okay. introduce our guests and, and then we'll get into the video. Um, and speaking of friends and support and love, uh, I'm going to introduce okay. Deborah Nevels, who I've known for a long time, as we were saying before we got on, since we were two. Uh, and so Deborah Nevels, currently works with the Medical College of Wisconsin with me as the program manager for community outreach and engagement for the Frederick Medical College Wisconsin Cancer Center. For seven years, she worked as the manager for health systems, hospitals Wisconsin for the American Cancer Society, which is where I first met Deborah, and is currently adjunct faculty at Concordia University in the College of Health Services Administration program. 
Throughout her educational career, she has strived to take advantage of opportunities to learn from others and share that wealth of knowledge. Although she has completed her educational pursuit, she considers herself to be a lifelong learner. Her experience is extensively rooted in healthcare. However, it all culminates with the interest in educating others. She has worked with under-resourced populations in Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, and Texas. Her innovative initiatives for community outreach and community building have impacted populations throughout the country. Her passion remains with promoting health education for those impacted negatively by social determinants of health. It is such a joy to welcome back to the Days of Learning, Back to the Kitchen podcast, our friend, Deborah Nevels. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. And I'm going to now introduce Julia Means. Julia Means is a registered nurse. And since 1986, 1996, after completing Marquette University's Parish Nurse Institute, she has served Milwaukee Central City as a parish nurse and as a result has served many urban ministries. Julia worked her way up the nursing career ladder, starting as a nursing assistant 40 years ago. She has pioneered the role of parish nurse within the Columbia St. Mary's Hospital. As the first parish nurse at the hospital, she helped to develop a unique role which accents outreach. Julia created Blankets of Love, a community-based prenatal and parenting education program targeting young African-American women. She assisted in the creation and implementation of the community-based chronic disease management clinics in food pantries to treat individual individuals living with hypertension and diabetes. And she presently coordinates Columbia St. Mary's Ebenezer Health Resource Center and the Urban Church Wellness Initiative. And I wanna say she wears a lot more hats than that. And um, me and Deborah are on some initiatives that maybe we'll get into as we get into our talk. But I just wanted to say it is just such a pleasure to have these two champions that we're going to be showcasing today. Thank you. Thank you. And I've learned so much from you, Yvonne, um, and it has changed um, my um, eating habits because of you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, speaking of eating habits, I, I mm -hmm. hope everybody had their lunch already or at least their <laughs> afternoon snack because uh, the Back to the Kitchen series, um, which will show a case of video, is going to make you hungry. And so <laughs> today we are talking stir fry. And so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get into the video and then we'll come back and talk about it. And then we'll get into conversation with our champions. Okay. Kelsey, you're ready with the video? Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the kitchen season two. I'm Yvonne Greer, registered dietitian and owner of Why Eat Right, nutritional consultant for healthy living. Today, we are going to go through the last of the four healthy recipes that are featured in the Back to the Kitchen curriculum. This program is being brought to you by MCOP, the Milwaukee County Organizations Promoting Prevention and the Medical College of Wisconsin in partnership with the State of Wisconsin's Chronic Disease Prevention Program through funding from the CDC's 1815 grant. So let's get started with our recipe, the chicken vegetable stir fry. The chicken vegetable stir fry contains fresh chicken breast, an assortment of vegetables, broccoli, carrots, celery, onion, pea pods, bean sprouts, and we will have some ginger. We will also have spices, your paprika, garlic powder, and for your, your seasonings to, to meld together, we're gonna to use a, a blend 
and the Kikkoman stir fry um, sauce will be used. But I'm going to tell you about some of these other ones as we go along. All of them have a different amount of sodium. And so I, I do want to make sure you know you don't have to use these. You can use cornstarch to thicken it and it still will be flavorful. But I'm not going to use cornstarch today. The last things is that we'll be adding and we'll be using your olive oil. I'm showing you the avocado oil because some people really are starting to use this because it has a higher smoke point. And then you have your water chestnuts to give it that crunch. So now we're ready to begin with preparing all of our vegetables and ingredients first before we start the stir fry. In slicing up your vegetables, I'm going to begin with the broccoli. How you prepare your broccoli is you first just push on the broccoli until you get to the soft part when it goes through easy. Then you're going to go through each one of these sections and then you're going to make those individual broccoli florets, they call them. Loaded with phyto chemicals and vitamins and it's been around for years and ages even back with in the days of Caesar who enjoyed this delicacy all I'm gonna do to finish this up if, if we have some long ones I'm gonna cut those off and again we can save those for soup I have this bag for all of the things that I'm saving so that I know I can just stick it in the freezer if I'm not ready to make a soup. But at least I have not thrown away any of the leftovers. And all I do to prepare the carrot is I take it and I'm going to be making long rows of carrot. The reason why I'm doing this is because it's going to be easier to slice into strips by doing this this way. And as many people know, carrots is loaded with beta carotene. So I'm just cut it in. So now all I'm gonna do is each one of these little things, I'm gonna kind of cut in four. So that you have some nice bite size. If it's too thick, I, you can make more, but see how easy it is to cut now that I've broken it down. And these are just bite-sized pieces that are cooked up evenly when we're doing our stir fry. Many people think that carrots is just good for your eyes, but carrots is very, and vitamin A that is going to be developed is very good for your immune system. I have some that's been already cut up, and I'll just add them to it. How I prepare the celery, because I cut that end off. And these I'm gonna save again for the soup bag. And for the celery, all you do is cut it in small little half moons and across. And that's all you have to do for your celery. It only called for three stalks, so it's not like you are using a lot. And then we've prepared some of our uh, onion, but I cut it from the top to the bottom. And then I'm just going to make slices, and I'm just going to cut all of these in half. And my onions is done. I'm trying purposely to make sure they are separate because how you add them to the stir fry, they are going to be separated. I'm gonna take my pea pods out. And for the pea pods, you almost do like string beans. When you take the end off and then you break it in half. I, I call them pea pods and the other people call them snow peas. So don't get confused if you see it in the store as snow peas. 
but I did some in advance and I think I have enough done so I'm just gonna save the rest of these I'm gonna cut up the ginger I peeled the ginger and I'm gonna cut that up now technically if you're using a, a prepared sauce it already has ginger in it but I wanted to make sure people see it's a woody type of a, a item and you would cut it up and you would add it in the beginning Things that are harder, you're going to add in the beginning. So what I'm going to do is just cut it long ways, and then I'm going to cut it. But it is kind of woody, and I, that's why I wanted people to see it who never used it. It is kind of like a woody root. And then you can just turn it, put them together, and then make small little dices. Everybody sees me using this knife, but it is one of the sharpest little knives. And for cutting up this ginger, you do need a sharp knife. But in the stir fry, you won't even notice that because you're going to be chewing and eating and enjoying. And again, it smells wonderful. With any stir fry, um, you can use that and it doesn't eat. You can even have a vegetable stir fry. You know, whatever you would like. The ginger is good for that and many other things because it's so healthy. I think we have all our vegetables uh, ready. The only thing I usually do is shake out the, the bean sprouts because they, they've been washed really good. So there's really nothing that you need to do. But you do, again, need to keep them separate because it makes a difference the rotation that you cook things in. The things that's harder, you're going to put in first. The things that cook faster, you're going to put in last. And so the bean sprouts is one of the last things that you put in. And so we keep, we're going to keep those separate. So you see, you have a nice array of all of your vegetables that are going to be used. Now we need to go and prepare our chicken. Again, everything needs to be prepared, cut up, sliced and diced, and ready to go because the stir fry process goes very fast. So now we're going to cut up the chicken. I'm going to do the strips, but we're going to actually make the chicken into bite-sized pizzas. You see, I've got my stronger knife, and I'm kind of sawing through the chicken. It makes it much easier to cut. Then to make the bite-sized pieces, I'm just going to cut this in about four, four times. This little fat here is not necessary, so I just usually cut it off. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'll just pull them all apart. I've prepared some in advance, so I want to make sure that we add. This is the second second um, chicken breast, and I'll just add this to it. So for this whole dish. You're only going to need two chicken breasts. And again, doing like we did before, about a tablespoon of garlic powder that we're going to sprinkle over the top. And then your paprika. And you put it on the chicken, you know, so that it gets cooked into the chicken because we're going to stir fry that chicken first. Again, we can mix it all up. So now we're finished with all the slicing and seasoning. Now it's time for us to start our cooking process. First, I'm going to turn on the fire and I'm going to leave it on high because I want the skillet to be very, very hot before adding in the olive oil. So now I'm going to add in a fourth of a, a cup of olive oil, the chicken. Ah, see, the oil did not reach the smoke point. You can see that the chicken is cooking quite fast and it's getting turning white. So now that the chicken is nice and white, we're going to add in our first ingredient and that is our onion and remember because this is on high heat it's cooking very fast 
I'm going to add in the ginger and stir nicely. It's ready for the celery. Each item is only going to be going for about one minute to two minutes before we add in the next ingredient. It's like we're ready for our carrots to be added in. And what I'm doing is I'm pushing the carrots to the bottom so it gets into the heat. Now I'm ready for the pea pot. You know, this is my favorite recipe. Look how beautiful that is. Now it's time for our broccoli. And again, with this, you want to push the broccoli to the bottom. The broccoli will turn a brighter green once you, once you know that it's being cooked. It will turn bright green. It's almost ready. All of them are made that color change. Now I'm ready to add in the bean sprouts. These do not have to cook long. It's beautiful. Our last ingredient to add before we add our sauce is our water chestnuts. I've drained the water chestnuts. These have no sodium added, so it's zero sodium, but they are nice and crunchy and give it that nice feel. At this stage, you can turn the heat down a little bit, so you don't want it to dry out or burn. You do want it to continue to cook. Now to add our sauce. I'm adding a third of a cup of Kikkoman sauce. Again, if you wanted to add and do a cornstarch blend, it would not add any additional sodium. If you didn't want to use a Kikkoman sauce, you can just use a vegetable broth just to give it a little moisture. And then you just make sure you put some of the juices from the bottom to the top on all sides. I think our dish is finished. Now it's time to plate with our brown rice. Delicious and nutritious. Mm. So here you have it our delicious, healthy recipe made with just a small amount of meat and loaded with vegetables. With this recipe, I've used a stir fry sauce that already has some sodium in it and some cornstarch for thickening. You can use your own cornstarch and lower the amount of sodium if you would like. There is also sweet and sour sauce that only has in a serving about 75 milligrams that is very low and you can make a sweet and sour chicken or you can make a teriyaki chicken this one has 220 milligrams in a tablespoon so as long as you are really conservative you will not overdo your sodium in this um, meal for those who like to add a little bit of soy sauce there is the reduced sodium soy sauce, but just keep in mind, only about a tablespoon or less should be used because it does add up in the sodium. Again, this is a great recipe for the entire family. You see, it makes loads of food that can be shared with all. So thank you, and let's get on to our invited guest. Wow, that was uh, really an interesting dish, Yvonne. I, I, I want to talk about it. Got a couple of things, a couple of comments and some uh, some questions. <clears throat> You know, yeah, the, I was I was having trouble technically getting back on, but I'm here. You you were you were sneaking off to get some leftovers. I could tell. <laughs> I just know you were doing that. No, um, you know. I, I'll say this because, you know, I know that um, 
the your our director is a is a whiz at at making this work together. But really, this recipe with six or seven vegetables did not does not have to take very long. No, no, it didn't. And it really, you know, once you get those vegetables all in a row and that uh, the chicken all ready, it probably, as far as the cooking time, takes no more than about 15 minutes. Because you really do have to keep adding those in right away because you got it on high heat. So it's not until you turn the heat down and you get them all in there, turn the heat down, put you, and then it cooks a little longer, but it's, it's pretty well done once you keep adding those vegetables. And by the time you add this sauce, it's, it's pretty well ready. And one of those, uh, you know, what you had there could feed a, a, a couple of people for probably a couple of days, or at least two or three meals. Well, it just depends on how big the family is, but definitely mm -hmm. there should be leftovers. I know I used to uh, make it for my children and we definitely had leftover for the next day. It was three of us. If you had about five people, then it's probably enough to feed five people. And remember five people with the, the only two chicken breasts. And, and you've got the brown rice added to it too. Yes, it's yes. One of those recipes that you could, if you had a larger family or you wanted to have leftovers, which we, we all agree that leftovers get better with time, um, that you could double the recipe easy enough to increase it without any more time. Without any more time at all. One thing I did want to mention, because I didn't mention on set, is that in the curriculum, the recipe is in the back to the kitchen curriculum, so everybody can just free and download that curriculum. But it also has a recipe in there for quick and easy chicken stir fry, which you go through the same step, but you get a bag of stir fry vegetable, frozen vegetables from the store. For those who just don't want to cut up everything individually, they can do that. And I've used it before and it turns out real good. Some of them even have the water chestnuts already in there. I tend to love my water chestnuts. So I might even add extra, even if it's in the bag mm -hmm. so I can have enough water chestnuts. But just think about that is that, you know, it's a, it's a quick and easy way for you to eat an abundance of vegetables. And you, I saw in the chat, you said six vegetables. And, and when I was coming up, if we didn't have at least a minimum of two vegetables, we thought the meal wasn't complete. Like, where's the other one? Where's the other vegetable? But that just was in our family. The other thing, one thing is that when I think about the branch out and, and, and going to the churches, I would tell them, and I always admit to people when I'm doing programs that one of my favorite dishes is fried chicken. And at the thing, when I thought about, you know, saying don't eat fried chicken, I thought about the idea that there could be different ways you eat chicken that's not fried. And so I set out to make an, uh, various different chicken recipes to demonstrate so that people know that, you know, even though you don't have to stop liking fried chicken, you just don't have to have fried chicken every time you have chicken. And now I don't fry any fried chicken at home because every now and then I might eat some out but it was a way for me to say okay even though I love fried chicken I just don't have to have fried chicken all the time and I always say that you don't you know there is no cheat day it's a choice you always have the choice to eat whatever you want but you can choose to eat healthier and still enjoy what you're cooking. And those are some of my favorite recipe, recipes, the stir fried um, chicken and then my curry chicken. I demonstrated that on um, the one before. You have been you consistent know. about that. And, and Bon, I think it's important for us though. Um, I have hypertension and I know that it, it, it many of us do. Uh, I have to watch the amount of sodium. Let's talk about some sodium and, and yes. about the importance of watching sodium. What is it? What are we, what is it, how much should we be eating of it? And what do we need to watch for, please? Well, sodium is a natural mineral and it's a mineral that our body needs, but we, it doesn't need a lot. You know, when they, when we look at how much we actually need, they say it's only 500 milligrams that we actually need. However, what can we tolerate in our body? The recommendations for your upper level of a sodium is 2,300 milligrams per day. That's for for the general people. But if you have issues with high blood pressure, they're saying your upper limit of how much sodium that you wanna keep on a daily basis is no more than 1500 milligrams. So when I sit in some of the um, uh, 
in the video that said, well, this has, has 220 milligrams. I'm looking at how does that compare to what you have for the whole day? And you can have that if you control how much you have of it. But say, for instance, if you had something that gives you like around six or 700 milligrams in one serving, can you see if you've created a whole meal, how you can easily go over that 1500 milligrams in a short order? I've been doing a uh, healthy, it's called a healthy heart ambassador program where people are really trying to measure their blood pressures on a regular basis at home, doing self-measured um, blood pressures and also working on their nutrition. And one class, uh, one of the ladies had an aha moment because I showed them this pre-made chicken patty and we looked at the sodium. In one chicken patty, there was a thousand milligrams of sodium. And she said, oh my God, I usually eat two at a serving. And she's already over her 1500 milligram with just two chicken patties. Sometimes we don't realize it's the processing because it's not only have table salt in there, but it has sodium preservatives. So make it a dish at home where you know how much sodium's in there. So the initial um, stir fry had no sodium added to it. And so it might have been, you know, at the most 150 milligrams in it. By me adding that, that sauce, it probably went up to per serving. I'm talking about per serving. It probably took it to maybe 250 milligrams of sodium in a serving. And then if you add in any of like the low sodium um, uh, soy sauce, then you might have pushed it into the 300 milligrams for the whole meal for the whole you know, serving on your plate. So but what they've really been trying to say lately that it's usually not if you made homemade food and added some sodium to it, that's gonna take you over. It's getting foods that already have the sodium in it. And because it's sodium preservatives and things, you don't even taste it. And some people may even put salt and pepper on that. And that drives you over the processed foods and some of those pre-made foods that you had no control over many times will push you over the edge. So that's what we're trying to get people to understand that, yes, we need to get back to the kitchen. We need to start cooking some home cooked food that we control how much sodium that we have. But also you, you can learn how to select the off of menus so that you get the healthier choice so that you don't go overboard in the sodium. It is, it is taking control, and, and as you have called one of your programs, it is taking charge and being able to make the decisions around your health and knowing, especially because we, we have audiences who, who, who might not have the most amount of resources. It doesn't have to cost great amounts of money yes. to eat healthy and to do well in that space. Yeah. My brother told me I should get stock in Audis. He said, he said, I should contact him because I found that when you look around, there's several places that you can go to that have low cost food like Woodman's, but because it's such a long distance to get there, one of the ones that's a little more convenient to get to that people in the community that has an income you know, limit know about is Audis. And yet I find that they have a, a great line of healthy foods and healthy healthy options so that you don't have to go to specialty stores to get what you need and it's it's affordable yeah and and there's there are places within within our uh within our uh, audience where like pete's fruit market on the yes. north and south side and um uh, el rey on the south side who are striving to do better and that there's advocacy that is happening around some of the bodega style things where at least we're striving to get people to offer more of those things yes. into the community. So we are, we are that work in progress, including that uh, issue around food equity and eating. So Yvonne, that was a wonderful, wonderful meal. Should we bring our champions on? Thank Should you. we do this? Yes, it's time for our champions because I know they're ready. <laughs> You know, they've just, they are such a, um, and I, I could see uh, Julia shake, uh, not shake, shaking her head in affirmation of the things that you were saying. And I can see Deborah making notes of, of things that she wants to comment on because she, much of the diet that we speak of um, relates to prevention of cancer as well as chronic diseases. Right. And I want to ask this, this question to start off. 
though we read your biographies or, or, or backstories, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and uh, how you come to this place in life as, as advocates and champions for community. Uh, Deborah, can I start with you? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. And Yvonne, I should have eaten beforehand. You <laughs> did not warn me. Um, wonderful recipe. I, and as David said, I looked at, I was watching what you were preparing and it was so much that I was like, oh, that can help reduce your cancer burden. And that can help reduce your cancer burden. Get those colors in there. That helps reduce your cancer right. burden. And that's what I do. I, um, I've always been one I, I say all the time, I love to sit at the knee of individuals and listen. I'm, I'm a big capture of stories and I love to hear other people's stories and other things that they've done to be able to stay healthy. And then to be able to share that information to others is what's so critical in the work that we do. Um, everything should be, as I've always advocated for, is that it's community driven and what the community needs. And David mentioned a little bit about food insecurity and food health equity and access is a big issue. Um, it's the things that you've talked about, Yvonne, that you always talk about. I agree, Julie said earlier <laughs> that I've learned so much more. I'm, I'm doing so much better because of listening to you. And one of the big things I think that's huge that everyone needs to listen to, you talked about it. Um, I, I, I will tell you, I paid in the past, paid more attention to the labels on my dog's food. Oh my God. Paid. <laughs> I'm guilty. I'm so guilty. Yes. I pay more attention because I was like, okay, I don't want any, any more than so many ingredients. I want it to be all natural. Da, da, da. And then let me grab this can of beans. And it was like, I wasn't thinking. And then oh also God. what also pays a big, big role in what, how we eat that I also have changed is looking at the portion. So a container mm -hmm is oftentimes not just one serving um, right. unless it says that on it and still read the back of it because it still may not be one serving. Um, but I've, I've learned to read the labels and also even going out to eat. Some of my most favorite restaurants, they put up, it's no longer a plate, it's a platter right. in front of you. <laughs> and I've gotten into the habit of saying, can I have the lunch portion? Or can I get a to-go container at the beginning? Yes. And then divide it and then save that for later. But it's it's there's a lot of things that we can do to change. Eating is a big one. Um, as David mentioned, I, I'm doing community outreach and engagement, talking about eradicating cancer in our communities that are that's hit the hardest by the cancer burden, um, but also doing prevention and screenings. Um, so that people know what their burden is, people know ahead of time. And the biggest piece of prevention is what we put in our bodies and also the exercise that we get. And we were just talking, I was, I was just talking about this in another meeting about the fact that getting up and moving, it's been very difficult um, with the COVID and I, I was working from home. I remember the day that they told us, March 18th at the medical college, it was for those who did not need to be on campus, you were to work from home. And that changed a lot. At first it was difficult to get that transition and that rhythm going. But then I found myself, I was like in between meetings, I get up and walk my dog. I get up and go outside, shovel some snow. I get up, go outside, check the plants, walk around the house and come back in. Um, and now I'm back in the office again. And unfortunately I can't bring my dog to campus. <laughs> I can go, but I can still get out, get up and walk outside and I have to get back in that rhythm again. So I think a lot of what you talk about, um, Yvonne, and a lot of what you've taught us is a lot about choosing, making healthy choices. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my coworkers is infamous for bringing her fruits and vegetables in. I want to be like her when I grow up, um, making, taking that time to prepare and to get ready for the next day. You can prepare right. the night before. Um, and so there's really, there isn't an excuse, but there's, there's opportunities to make little baby steps to make a difference in your life. The one baby step, if I read my dog's food label, I can read my label too. <laughs> you know, I can I, read I, that too. 
I, I love that. And, and oh, I'll, I'll just goodness. say this in jest that at least your dog doesn't have hypertension then. So we'll get <laughs> he does not. He does no, not. he's not stressed at all. <laughs> he's not stressed at all. He, he is stressed. You know, they're, they are actually saying that some dogs that people had the pandemic and puppies and dogs are having that withdrawal from their humans because humans are going back uh, to work. Yeah. Uh, uh, Julia, let's have you jump in and, and tell us a little bit about your backstory of your career in nursing and in, as uh, a, an advocate and champion for the community. Oh, You're on you mute. can't hear you. Prior to being in the community, I was an intensive care nurse. So mm -hmm. I, I saw people that were critically ill and many of them coming directly from home because I was a medical uh, intensive care nurse. So we, we got the strokes and the, um, high uh, blood sugars and the, and the DKA and all that. Um, and, and I was just um, um, so uh, saddened that my community was uh, dying before their time because of the illnesses that, that, that no one was there to work with them. And we know that health literacy is um, um, it's uh, not well in our community because so many healthcare professionals uh, speak the healthcare language. And so uh, I just went out into the community. Most parish nurses stayed within their churches, but I went everywhere. Um, I went to Clinton Rose Senior Citizen Center. Yeah. I went yeah. to uh, every place that people were gathering and uh, educated our community. And, and um, many times they, didn't know my name. They just say, "Hey, nurse. Hey, nurse. Can you come over here? Can you come over there?" And uh, they would ask me to go to people's homes because people were in their homes, uh, in bed, uh, with no resources and and anything. And and I have tons of stories of how you get people to the hospital. You get them primary care physicians. You get them set up. So when uh, we started a food pantry, we did a diabetic friendly food pantry. And I try to go to food pantries throughout the city. And I went to a food pantry yesterday and I knew the, um, the uh, person that was running it. And she said, oh, Julie, don't you come here with that my plate stuff? Because, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of people feel that um, just because you come to a pantry, you shouldn't have to eat healthy. Well, Oh, I, I don't right. want them to think like that. So they want to give them the day-old bakery, the day-old uh, chips and, and all that stuff where we eliminated all that stuff from the pantries that we serve. And when you work with Hunger Task Force, that, that's their goal to really right. push that my plate and um, to get more fruits and vegetables, low sodium canned goods and, and everything. So we really uh, work with them. I also have a diabetic support group where they come once a month and we talk about uh, things they can do. And one thing Yvonne always taught, she always gave you hope that you can do this. It's mm -hmm. easy. Uh, you don't have to, you know, go home and throw out everything in your refrigerator and your uh, cabinet. You can, you can, uh, let me show you how you can use uh, meals that we're familiar with, but make them low fat, low sodium. And, um, and that gives you hope and builds you up. Um, instead, some, I was at one uh, educational um, session and this woman was just uh, um, teaching all this stuff about uh, diet nutrition. And I could look at the participants face and they were so confused and so lost. And I just had to stand up and say, look, I want you to leave here with one thing that you're gonna work on when you go home. Mm -hmm. um, you can do this. You're not going to do it overnight. <clears throat> we can help you, but you are not defeated. You can be winners and we're going to work with you with that. You don't throw everything at somebody at, at yeah. one meeting. You try and get them to see, uh, do a, a, a dish that they will like um, mm -hmm. and things. Um, Yvonne, you taught us how to do the cabbage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just think about... <laughs> I think about how you taught us what bread to eat and what um, butter, you know, what uh, artificial or imitation mm -hmm. butter you should use and, and things like that. I'm still doing that, that you mm -hmm. taught years ago. And yeah, so we had, a, we had Metastar actually um, 
contracted me in my early days of Why Eat Right to do a, a project. And didn't we get about uh, at least about six or seven different churches together? It was a number of churches. They all had representative. And then after that one meeting, and we did we did about six recipes in one session. Mm -hmm. We did, we actually made all, all types of recipes and they got to taste and sample all People of the recipes. It. And then they actually paid for me to do sessions at each one of the churches over that coming year. And yeah, it was, we, like you said, it was a wonderful program. It was a, and you, and you sent us home with the food. Yeah. So we yeah, could, we we could try the too. recipes at home with what you had. And, yeah. and, and because of that, you, and you always taught us that we can do this. Uh, we just have to change a few habits and it's going to work out. And that gives people hope, you know. I used to say, I, I used to say, you are amazing chefs so that you can figure out a way to make it taste good. Even if you don't have the sodium that you're amazing chefs and you can do this. So, and people yeah. would come back with their little recipes and, oh, yeah. and the guys were just as in it as the women were. And it was just so um, um, amazing. Like I said, you, changed how I eat and, and shop. And um, you did it where I didn't feel defeated. I felt like I could do it. Well, I wanna just add one thing is that as you were talking about how you were working in the hospital situation, I also started off as a cardiac surgery and intensive care unit dietitian working at St. Luke's Medical Center. And I was on the heart transplant team. And so I was mm -hmm. seeing everyone after they already had a heart condition, you know, you know, after the fact, and I would, you know, give instructions. I would follow them all the way from before surgery, through surgery, after surgery, and then teach them how to, um, what to eat when they would go in home. And I was starting to say, wow, wouldn't it be great if I can get to people before? And some of the people said, oh, I've never had a diet instruction, or I never, mm -hmm. I never yeah. heard that before. And I thought, I'm going to have to get out there and start telling people ahead of time so that they can prevent. And that's what drove me to go to the health department and to get into the field. And now I'm getting them ready to be a doctor of public health. And so it, it, when, we, when you tell those stories and David brought up something I did years ago as a, as a young dietitian, and this was one of my beginning programs that I did with Why Eat Right. And it just, it, to me, it's such a pleasure to hear that it's memorable. It's memorable and, and that it was practical, that it was something people could do. And that's one of the things when we talk about success stories and, you know, not just looking at the negative about social determinants yeah. health, but how can you positively promote health and wellness? And some of the things that you're doing now seems like you already have put into play some of those positive things. And I, yeah. I kind of, I, I think that's where I wanted to go to, because I know you talked about the, the blanket. Well, you didn't talk about blankets of love as much. So I wanted to hear about blankets of love. And Deborah is doing a lot of things I, that she's doing in, on the south side of, of Milwaukee. So I want to hear a little bit more about those things. So I don't know, Deborah, if you want to try to start and then you can tell us about that blankets of love a little bit more. Yeah, well, it's it. I think the blankets of love is Julia, but I, the oh yeah, a lot, yes. of, yeah the, a lot of the work right now that we're doing is um it's actually concentrated on the north side, but it's oh okay. Um, we have uh, some projects that are going on, looking at working with churches. Um, as Julia's already done very very well, we followed in the footstep in the footsteps of trying to support health ministries is one of our focal points, and being able to have um we had had the blessing to have you on not once, but twice yes, in um, January uh, um, that you did, uh, oh, oh, sorry, um, that you did in January, uh, you did a nutrition class that was phenomenal. And we got a really good feedback from that. Um, but it's, it's, we've been able to switch to go virtual and have people on, um, to do education and training. And so we have one, uh, and as you said, Yvonne, you mentioned um, you used to see people after incidents, yes. um, after health crises. And one of the things that we have several projects going on that note after diagnosis, after, for example, a cancer diagnosis, things don't stop. 
Um, you still need to live healthy. You still need to be healthy. Um, in February, we featured a uh, cardio oncologist, Dr. Sherry Ann Brown came on and talked a little bit about um, uh, preparing, being heart healthy at the before there's a diagnosis, but also the importance after diagnosis. Then um, we also, we have a, a project that's currently going on working with men who are um, prostate cancer survivors. Yes. And that's the Men Moving Forward project. And that includes not only exercise afterwards, which is phenomenal, but it talks about after you've been diagnosed and treated, that there's importance in staying active and eating healthy. And also one of the key things that I think all of us have done is the mindfulness, yes. um, going to meditation, reducing the stress, um, learning how to take care of yourself, and then also getting your partners involved. We also um, uh, have several, we have another event that's coming up. The importance, and I think you lead to it a little bit, is understanding your family health history. Yes. And so pulling, we call it pulling back your roots, um, the importance of genetics in your health. And we, as, as I said, I really, really love storytelling. And this involves everyone throughout Southeastern Wisconsin, North, South Side, Kenosha Racing, everybody come on. The first event is gonna be virtual. And we have a geneticist who's coming, who's gonna talk a little bit about the importance of genetics in um, chronic health diagnoses, but also the importance of knowing that genetics beforehand. Okay. So knowing um, that there's hypertension that runs in my family, knowing that diabetes runs in my family. Knowing it is one thing, because we're great storytellers. Right. We can sit around a, a big mama and the rest and they can tell us all about the history, but no one's writing it down. And so it's really important that we not only capture the information and know it, but that we write it down. And so there's tools that we'll be sharing at that event on April 30th, which will, um, you'll be able to fill it out. Yep, <laughs> um, we'll be able to fill it out and keep that history. And one of the things we wanna do is, you know, when you get this information, don't get scared, don't get nervous, but it's time to act. So if yeah. you know that high blood pressure runs in your family, you know that heart, heart condition runs in your family, then maybe let's start, let's start, you know, some of these family reunions, let's do stuff outside. Yes. Let's get back to stuff that I remember doing back in North Carolina, doing the sack races and playing tag and running mm -hmm. all around. Yeah. You know, we can eat and everything, but let's run, let's get moving. Let's walk around the lake. Let's walk around the park, um, get active. But when we sit down to eat, then let's get one of, one of the young folks there to sit down and fill out the family health history tree. Um, and so th those are activities that we're trying to do, trying to make sure that we involve um, the community in actively knowing what your health history is. And then not just writing it down and putting it aside or framing it, but let's write it down. Let's email it to everybody that you know so they can add information. And then when I go to see my nurse, my doctor, my PA, um, when I go in, I can say, you know, I just found out that my aunt and um, my, my niece had breast cancer. I, is it a need for me to get checked early? Or I know that I found out that my grandfather and my father all had issues with colorectal cancer. Do I need to get my colonoscopy sooner? It's getting screened early that is the prevention, but also taking things like you were talking about, um, Julia and Yvonne and David, we were all talking about this taking things in our own hands so that we can be participants actively in our healthcare, that we can call our doctor and say, look, I just had a meeting with my family and found out X, Y, Z. I know that we've been watching and watching me because my weight has been going up or that I found a lump in my breast or that you, know, I, you had this early colonoscopy, but now I found out that there's something else we need to look for because immediately within my family, there's something we need to do. Um, but that th it's those efforts that we need to make sure that our family is our our families and our communities are equipped with the information and the knowledge, and we know how to track it. We know how to write it down. Right, right. And quit uh, hot stuff. Quit not talking about it. Not talking about it doesn't make it go away. Right. It doesn't make it go away. It's one of those things where you know, just because Big Mama had women issues, name it. What was it? Did she have to have a hysterectomy? Did she have, did she have 
you know, uh, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that what was it? Not just women's issues, but let's call it. Let's mm -hmm. name it for what it is because I can't tell my children, well, your grandmother had women's issues. That could be a whole slew of right. things. I need to name it. She had diabetes. She had high blood pressure. She had cervical cancer. Write it down. Put it someplace where you can find it and tell your kids so they also know. Mm -hmm. I agree, I'm, Deborah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tradition to you to put the... Um, the um, Blankets of love only because when I started looking at health throughout the life cycle, I also know that sometimes, you know, we don't realize the connection from the, the, the very start of life on mm -hmm. how the start of life starts to what happens as we get older. And so nutrition throughout the life cycle, Julia is dealing with the whole cycle. And sometimes she don't even talk about the, the, the outreach to the elderly that she's doing. But right now, if you can tell us about the Blankets of Love program. Yeah, since 04, I've been working with pregnant women um, to decrease the infant mortality rate in Milwaukee, yeah. which we, our numbers are always so high. Excuse me, let me tell you, this is, is Black Maternal Health Week, by the way. Yes, yes. And not only are our babies dying now, but our moms are too. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot has to do with being overweight um, when we get pregnant and um, the different uh, issues that come up during pregnancy. Um, I, it just, you know, like you said, it, it starts when you are pregnant and trying to get them to eat a healthy nutritional meal um, that will nourish the baby try to encourage them to breastfeed instead of bottle feeding. As we know now, all of the formula is being recalled and now it's even a shortage and they're running around trying to find milk for the babies. Um, but if they were breastfeeding, they would not have that problem. Um, um, they, to, when I see a, a toddler eating a, a Cheeto, and, and even in the store, or I see the moms giving them something in the store or a, a bottle with Kool-Aid in it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, just certain things just, just really um, drive me, you know, up the wall. And I'll go in the store and talk to the mom because most of the time the babies need to be off the bottle and on a sippy cup. And mm -hmm. when they're on the sippy cup, that um, helps them with their speech. When they okay. stay on the bottle, it, 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 uh, it delays their speech. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of things and, and you know, moms want to do what's best for their babies. They just don't know. Right. Um, right. So when you talk to them and, and tell them that high, high sugar, high salt foods um, make them get used to that and they, right. they want it more. So you need to start when they're young with healthy foods and then they would, um, they would always want that healthy food. Um, they, um, a lot of the babies have dental problems, yep. um, as toddlers because of the bottles being left in the mouth while they go to sleep. And then they have all of, uh, the, the cavities in their mouth yep. before the teeth, other teeth actually fall out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I've, I had, uh, I have, um, hygienists come in and talk to them and show them what they need to do and how they could, uh, work with their children and help and prevent that from happening. And you know what? They change behavior. Mm -hmm. Once they learn it, they change behavior because mm -hmm. poor mothers love their infants too. They just don't know any better. So once we okay. teach them, we see change behavior. I had um, uh, uh, some guests there for dinner and the, diet, uh, the um, hygienist was teaching what to do uh, with the, the toddler. And, um, and, and a lot of people are so taken back by our young people because they're, you know, like in your face, they, you know, how, how they behave, but I'm used to them. So um, she was, uh, the lady was a little nervous. She said, I wonder if they heard me, I don't know. And um, I said, um, we, were, we sit down and we always have a meal. So I'm always modeling for them healthy meals and good, mm -hmm. good food. So they right. want to do it at home. I said, look over there in the corner. And she looked over there in the corner and the mom was flossing her baby's teeth. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I said, she heard you. She's going to do it. We just have to give them opportunities. And we can't assume because they're right. a little rough around the edges that they don't want what's best for their infants. And so uh, I've been doing it since 04. Um, we did it through pandemic. We got um, where we did uh, Zooms with them. Okay. Wonderful. Now this year, we're starting to work with the dads. Okay. Uh, this is the first time I have a dad's program. One, one time I had 10 dads come and they, and, and um, you know, I'm getting old, but the one dad said, I said, well, you seem like you're so excited becoming a dad. He's like, yeah, I post every night. I'm going, huh? <laughs> you post every night <laughs> you you need a job you need no, no I, I have to i have to um i gotta go with the times you know uh, right <laughs> but he's so excited he's posting every night i don't know what he's posting but he is that that's and, right uh, we want to keep that uh, if, uh, his excitement going and and we're teaching them and training them uh, what what the um, mom is going through trimester by trimester, how they can help and assist and what they can do to be uh, strong fathers when they go for office visit and, and they can be labor coaches. So they're all excited. And um, <clears throat> I was a little thrown back, but 10 guys came and they, they look so young and they sit there and they twist their hair and <laughs> well, oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are the well, dads. The one reason why I really wanted to have have you talk about the young people is when we, we start looking at that whole spectrum, many times we don't realize that we are actually, or they are actually learning from us. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, many of them don't know if, if they're not getting it in school, which sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. If they don't have other family members that they can mimic after, uh -huh, uh -huh. who then can they get it from? And that's where we start getting into some of the things that we are going to be um, working in in one of the grants that I'm working in is the uh, a CDC Social Determinants of Health Accelerated Action Plan grant, which is saying that we need to really look at um, the environment. We're looking at community clinical linkages and we're looking at social connectedness mm -hmm. and some of the things that you're talking about and some of the things that you are doing is bringing that social connectedness in there where we can share we can share information we can be a social support to people because some of the social determinants health people are born into mm -hmm. they're born into their life the, the 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 families you know sometimes they're born into low income and i think i was surprised when i heard that food insecurity can be passed from generation to generation to generation. generation. And I was like, how did that happen? Because of the fact that sometimes when you don't have the nutrition and you don't have the opportunities and you don't excel in school and you don't do all these things, then your offsprings are in that certain situation. They may have the same situation that carries on to their children. And when you were talking, just think, and that's what I tell some, some young women that when you're, when you're pregnant and that baby that you're carrying will be born with the eggs that they have for life. Mm -hmm. So you actually are nurturing not just your baby, but your grandchildren your too. Your grandchildren too. And yes. how you eat can affect your grandchildren. And they were like, what? So I, it, it's very important. And I think some of the things that we're, we're finding out is these social determinants of health are there. If you, we're going to be trying to tackle them. Mm -hmm. But the success stories is how you may be changing whole families, like when you were talking about genetics, by understanding today and eating healthier and passing that on to your children who will pass it on to their children. And then you can maybe kind of stop that generation, generational passing down of health issues and problems and things. Yes. Um, if you don't know how to make a grocery list, you don't know how to plan meals, you don't know um, how to go to the store and get what you need. Um, just teaching them how to do uh, uh, nachos with turkey meat instead of hamburger and just uh, making um, <clears throat> little substitutions that, and, and they like, they prefer the turkey meat once they uh, found yeah. out. And we all know hamburger went up like crazy. Right. So um, mm -hmm. that helped. 
but just mm -hmm. to be able to show them how they can stretch their dollars and uh, take them to Fondi Market and show them how they can buy fresh. And just to teach them, uh, get them away from the fast food store that eats up their money so quickly and uh, leaves them without and, and uh, uh, sugary drinks. Those are some of the things that we work on the most. Right. I want to I want to come back to this because you you each have mentioned this and we talk about getting to the root of it the the, the social determinants and I think of those social conditions and structures of the places we live work play pray and educate you've all mentioned churches for example let's talk about why this is so important to incorporate. Uh, health education into a church ministry, as opposed to just in the clinical space or, or, or in the hospital, which frankly can be such a confusing place. Yvonne, I actually want to start with you on this one. You mentioned it first about getting churches together. Why is that such an important thing when we talk about social determinants like a church as a place for health education and health information? Well, churches in, in general, and especially in um, communities of colors, have held a very revered place. It's been a, a place wherein people feel that this is a place that has helped me to survive. This is a place that has given me peace. This is a place that I know I can be myself and I can take my troubles and problems to and won't be 100% totally judged. And so many of the churches know that not only do they need to feed the spirit and really to, to give them that, that spirit of hope and, and of, of, of the Lord, but also the idea that your, your health and well-being is so important too, because it's the temple and that your spirit lies in. So there is a lot of emphasis in the church on being healthy and living a healthy life. And this is nothing that is new or has started, but I think that the churches have taken a larger role in health education and has taken a, 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 a much more active role in promoting health and, and wellness. And I know that from when we had the Branch Out program, which was years ago, even to now, the pastors are very passionate. They used to have Diabetes Sundays from the Diabetes Association. They used to have Search Your Heart program from the Heart Association. So there has been all kinds of initiatives that have been um, developed and promoted through the church. Now, I always say, you know, there is definitely some people who are not involved in the church, but there is a wide range of, of input even though some people don't go to the actual church they are still influenced by the church and the church people and the people in the community and that connection is there so when we talk about social connections the church is a key social connection that many people look towards and so if they have a walk in the community more than this the church people are going to come to the walk all sorts of people are here about it and they'll come they do a lot of outreach as a ministry. So the church is such a key, key avenue that, you know, for us, it's a natural place to go. And I think that that is, it, it, it's kind of like a, a place of comfort. So I, why I, not have health and wellness in a church? I, I love that. And it's, and it's an example. And, and, and Deborah, I want you to speak to take it from Yvonne, because you deal with some very serious issues when we talk about cancer. Yeah. But unlike when it was cancer when we were a child, cancer no longer is, doesn't have to be a death sentence. Right. And, and how, is, <clears throat> how has that evolved to where we're working on not only people who have cancer, but preventing people from getting cancer in the first place? And how has the community embrace that and and what has been the response of that it has been wonderful i can tell you um it's i mean I'm starting with understanding that when we walk into the community we're not going in and saying okay everybody you know we're just going to push mammograms and prostates 
colorectal cancer and all that kind of stuff. We're not gonna just push the screening initiatives first. We're gonna look into what else can we do to be supportive? What else is going on in your community? And I know Yvonne loves when I talk about this. So it's it's one of the ways that I'm really, really proud about where I am now with the medical, with Freight and Medical College of Wisconsin. We are looking at eradicating cancer through a restor restorative justice lens. And in order to eradicate it from that lens, what we're looking at is that it's not just the screenings and the education and the prevention but it's that we need to come together at the intersection of community voice and discovery to bring both of those voices together so that one, the community voice is at the table at the very beginning, when we start talking about designing programs, we start talking about looking into research and the why, that they're at the beginning and we're building on the assets that are already exist in the community, but that also when our docs, such as yourself, go into the community, that you're able to sit down and talk about the work. Why is genetics important? Well, let me, let, let me sit you down with a geneticist who can talk to you about why this is important. Well, why do, what exactly happens when I get a prostate screen? Let me sit you down with a doctor who can tell you why this is effective and why this is important for African-American men to get the screening now. Well, why should I get a mammogram and what exactly does that entail? Well, let me tell you the connection between your parent, your mom, your aunts, your sister having cancer, breast cancer, and what that means for you. And so it's restoring justice by first taking that very simple concept by admitting that there are things that have gone on in our community, that there were harms that were done. And now we want to sit down with the community and say, what is it that you want? I'm not going to come to the community and go, Oh, look, here's a fit kit. I need you to do this right away mm -hmm. to get your colorectal screening when everything else that um, we've talked about before are issues. So if you don't know what you're going to eat tonight, if you have issues with um, um, having a, a Wi-Fi or your, your child's learning from home or your, your child is not well, if you have a bunch of other issues that are going on, it's important for me to sit down with you and work with you to help resolve those issues. Now, I'm not trying to be a one-stop shop and answer to everything, but I am saying, let me call Yvonne, let me call Dr. Nelson, let me call Julia to see if there's other pieces, other resources in the community that we can bring together. And by bringing those resources together, oftentimes we're bringing them together at the church because that, that is where many people gather we know, we know, and this is part of what you were talking about is why are we looking to the church? We know people are going to be there on Sunday. We know that they'll be there at least two, one or two times a week for either Bible study, choir practice, YPWW, I'm probably dating myself. Um, but um, there's, there's other opportunities where we know people are going to be there. So that's where we need to be. There's also the church, as Julia has done, there's a nurse that's going to be at that church. We know the church, the nurse that's going to be there. We know when she's going to be there. So even though I may not go to that church, Miss So and So, who came, uh, you came to me the other day and talked about service, also talked about the fact that there's a parish nurse that's right there. I'm gonna go there because you know I can't this cough that I have, and while I'm there, she also is gonna tell me a little bit about some other resources. So I think that. When you look at the education that we're doing, even when I'm, yes, cancer prevention, era, excuse me, eradicating cancer is critical and important. It is critical and important, but I am not going to bypass the fact that there are other issues in your life that are also equally important. And we've got to address those two. And we got to be present for that conversation. I, I, I love that. And Julia, if you wouldn't mind, with the last bit of time, if you could speak into you, you, you have spoken about early the blankets of love, which is just beautiful for mothers and babies. <clears throat> and, and Deborah talked about churches, but could you talk about some of your work with um, some of the, um, the elder, the senior outreach programs that you're doing and, and how that fits into this, this lifescape and, and the social determinants of health? You know, if you win the seniors over, you got the whole family because people, <laughs> uh, people are going to go to grandma uh, and, and they're going to go to them. And if they uh, trust and believe in you, they're going to send their young people to you. They're going to send 
people that have problems to you because they trust you. Now, a lot of the young people don't go to church like their grandmother did, but they do expect to get married in the church and to get buried in the church. So yeah. there is still that connection there. Um, but like you, um, the seniors, um, they're there. They're still coming to church. As long as they can make it, they're coming. Um, but I had a young mom who uh, made it to church one Sunday and I didn't see her. She was in the back, but I heard the baby crying and I heard a cry of pain. I, I knew that wasn't a normal baby cry. So I looked in the back and sure enough, it was one of my young ladies and she was so distraught. And so I went, I went back and I said, how long has this been going on? And um, she's crying and I, that's a, I said, okay, okay, that's all right, that's all right. Um, I left the church and took the baby to urgent care. The baby had bilateral ear infections okay. and um, was just in an elevated temp. The baby was sick. So I, I took her to urgent care and the urgent care people kept wanting to say, oh, grandma, how you doing? And I'm like, they just assumed I was her her uh, mother and that was my grandbaby, but um, that was blanket of love. And she knew if she made it to church, she would get help. She knew that. And um, I took her to Walgreens and got the meds and I said, I'm gonna call you later on the night to see if things are better. She's like, okay, she's just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Her mother was home, but um, her mother did not address the situation. But uh, she knew if she made it to the church on Sunday, she would get some help. So um, our uh, African-American community um, have such strong ties and uh, um, beliefs that the church is a place of help, whether, they, um, whether they're not going, they may not ever go to church, but they still see the church as a place of help. And, um, and they don't mind coming for help. Um, a lot of people would say, you mean pregnant women are willing to come to the church? Yeah, because they know they're not gonna be judged. They're gonna be helped. And um, they know that they will get what they need. And that's partly because that senior in their life is from the church. I just, I just love that and appreciate the, the, the narrative. And it's, it's, you know, we've used church as an example, but this could happen in a park, in a playground. You mentioned, Julia, doing things in the grocery store, which is a national environment for health. And, and so, you know, and we, we will always acknowledge that there's more to be done, but there's a heck of a lot going on. And I think that it, it matters. Yvonne, I want to, I want to turn it to you because I got to tell you that this session has just, it's time. We, we could go on and on, but we're just not going to keep our guests that long. Give us some wrap-ups. Well, so some of my wrap-ups and takeaways are that we need to learn to cook in a healthy way, but in a cultural way, mm -hmm. that you need to meet people where they're at in your and, and help them to move into a uh, a better place to know your health history and to share specifics with mm -hmm. each of your family members um, to give hope, not just information. That's a good. To help people to know that they can do this. And if you win your seniors over, you get the whole family. Mm -hmm. And that the church is still a gathering place of trust and of peace. So those were my big takeaways. That is phenomenal. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Julia Means and, and Deborah Nevels, thank you for joining us today. What a thank joy you. it is to have you. And I, I want to say this, I'm going to say it here that um, I, am, I am a little bit sad in that this is our last Back to the Kitchen, uh, Yvonne, and uh, it has truly been a, an honor and a joy to do this series with you. Um, and, and I'm gonna say this, 
I want to say this. You you talked okay. about giving. You have about giving hope, but when you give hope, we receive hope in turn. Thank you, thank you. And I just wanted to mention. I have a smile every every program I do. I think, oh, this is the best one. This is the best one. <laughs> you know, this is the best one. You know. But this is the last from one from season two. But my smile is because we already know we're going to have a season three and we're going to have <laughs> many more health champions that come on. And people have been really tuning in. And many times they're sharing this with their networks. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in other places, you get a whole lot of comments. And um, with this, we get a whole lot of shares. Mm -hmm. So we know that lots of people will be hearing your words. And I just, I, I'm, I'm just in awe. One thing when I was thinking about what, what you said about uh, playing together, they used to have a program called Get Back to the Backyard. And I remember um, after we would have our family meals, we would go and play red light, green light, mm -hmm. stop, and Captain yep. Maya, and, and all kind of little games outside. I'm thinking, wow, we need to get back to doing cool. that again, and just mm -hmm. having fun with our families, and uh, not just sitting there eating and going to sleep or something. Get, you know, make it so we do get have moving. that fun. Mm -hmm. just, just be out, be home when the lights come on outside. The street lights come <laughs> on is when you need to be home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We all know that piece of it. Uh, so well, thank, thank you, everyone, for, thank for you, being Julia, here. Thank you, Deborah, Yvonne, uh, Kelsey, our, our engineer and director, and Richard Allen, our, our, our extraordinary um, filmmaker. We thank you. I am David Nelson, and this is Days of Learning, Back to the Kitchen. It's not goodbye, but till we see you next time. See you, and see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you.